welcome you all. I think uh, it's about time we uh, just start. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, generating TypeScript with Drupal. Uh, my name is Rolf van Pil. I work at Hoppinger, uh, that's a development agency in Rotterdam. Uh, and uh, I'm going to show you uh, some of the work that we did with uh, TypeScript and Drupal. Uh, the idea is that uh, we first start with a bit of introduction of what we're trying to generate and why. Then I want to spend the majority of the time on actually generating code because that's the fun part. Uh, and then I want to uh, say something about how I see uh, how we see this uh, developing in the future. And then hopefully there's some time for questions. If you have questions in the meantime, then just raise your hand. If it's something that I know I will address, address later, then I'll say just wait for time. Yeah. Cool. Uh, so the Drupal REST API. Uh, what we're trying to do, is, uh, the situation that we're, that we're having is this. So we have a Drupal application, and uh, right, it talks to a database and everything, and we have a front-end application in JavaScript. Uh, we do that with React, but this talk is not about React. We can also do to have the same concept with Vue or with no framework at all. Uh, the concepts still, still apply. So if the, this application wants to retrieve content from Drupal, then it does that using the Drupal REST API. So Drupal has some API that the front end can say, hey, I would like some content, and then Drupal says, hey, here you got some content. And then it's up to the front end to handle that content, right? Uh, that's the case that we're talking about. So uh, I made a very simple uh, so demo installation where we're going to toy with. Uh, it's just Drupal Core, the REST UI module, so I can actually enable the, uh, the REST interface. And I made a custom theme so I have somewhere to store my TypeScript. Because in, the, in our example, we write TypeScript, and the TypeScript is then compiled into JavaScript. Uh, and I'll show you in a minute why we think that's a good idea. Uh, so, what is happening? Uh, oh, this was stupid, sorry. Uh, like this, yeah. Um, here we have it. So here we have a very simple standard installation Drupal with a custom theme. So we have some JavaScript to load. Uh, and if we go to, uh, to a node, uh, we wrote, already wrote a little bit, a bit of JavaScript to actually uh, request content from the Drupal in JavaScript. So you see if we filter for the HHR request here, you see, let me see if I can actually increase that because you can't see. Um, here you see the request that, that the front end application sends to the Drupal uh, and its response, uh, well, this is a bit better viewable, is some JSON object which contains all the information that Drupal has about this node, right? I think most of you have seen this before. This is the kind of data that we're trying to handle. And we're trying to handle that using TypeScript. And I'm also wanting, uh, would like to say something about that TypeScript. Uh, no, I'm skipping. Uh, uh, in my head, I was already skipping a part of my presentation. I first want to show you a bit on how Drupal actually generates a representation of a node. So we have, uh, let me see, we have that representation of a node, and it contains all the fields that we have. So there is a body, and there is a created and a default language code, and all other different things. Uh, and we need to figure out how does Drupal create this? So Drupal uses a structure for that that's called serialization. Uh, and I'm going to find a bit of the code for that. And I'm going to make a drawing for that. Let me see where it is. Uh, Drupal hit this very well. Uh, here it is. Serialization uh, normalizes. So 
What does Drupal do? Uh, this part you can't remember, right? So we have a front end application that's opposite to Drupal. Um, so let's get rid of this. So what Drupal does is at uh, the, the generation, if we have a node object, and we want to convert that to that JSON representation that we saw, right? So what it does, it has that node, the node is an entity, and um, every entity that has a list of fields, and every field is an instance of a field item list class, and then every item in the class, in the in the list of field items is you would get a field item and then at the field item points to structured data so a string or a number or whatever so then there is data like the nodes are need for example so if we take this uh, here so there is a field uh, let's use node id as an example there's a, a node there's a field node id so we have the entire node that is there's this, and there's the field node ID, which is a list of items, and every item has data, in this case, just one piece of data, a number, which is called spell. And Drupal converts this to JSON using a structure called normalizers. So the idea is that for each of those objects, there is a class that can convert it to JSON. Or actually, it doesn't really convert it to JSON, it converts it to just plain and simple arrays, and then the whole end result is pushed into JSON encoding. Uh, so, so it stays an array until the whole node is represented as an array, and then the whole thing is JSON encoded and done, and it's JSON. So there is a entity normalizer. And the entity normalizer is just a class that says, okay, I got an entity, so the entity is pushed into the entity normalizer, then it just loops over all the fields, and for every field, it says to a field item list normalizer, you wouldn't guess it, it says, hey, here you got a field item list, I don't know exactly what to do with this, but you know. So then the field list, field item list normalizer gets the field item list, and that one knows, okay, I should just loop over every item and then push every field item into a field item normalizer. So there's field item normalizer that receives the field item. And the field item normalizer knows that it should loop over all the properties that field item has, and for every property it should have the, the correct data normalizer. Uh, there, of course, for every type of data there's a different way of normalization, so there's a lot of different data normalizers, and each of them receives the data and converts it into something that can later be represented as JSON. So, and then the whole end result is pushed back up into the tree, and then the entity normalizer eventually has something that represents the whole node, because this one returns something that represents, for example, a string, as just a string. This one then creates that associative array, which just tell you is number, and this one then creates an array around that, and this one creates another associative array with every field item in it, and the end result is the representation that we have here. So that's how Drupal generates it. So there's a lot of classes involved, actually, even more than I just drew. Um, I'm going to show them. Here is just a list of normalizer classes that Drupal Core has. So that's actually quite a long list, um, because I simplified it a bit. I said there's a thing called an entity normalizer, but in fact there's an entity normalizer and there's a content entity normalizer and a config entity normalizer because they all work in mysteriously different ways. Um, so there's a lot of classes involved. And how does Drupal know which class to use? Uh, 
because if we take a look, for example, at the entity, uh, uh, entity is a bad, bad example actually. There is here the type data norm, uh, com complex data normalizer. Here it is. So here is that that logic that I talked about in the in the entity. So it loops over all the properties. In this case, the properties of an entity is just the fields, and for every field, uh, so so it gets every field, and for every field, it says, "Hey, normalize this." So that that that's literally what happens here. Here it calls the serializer. The Drupal hides this in a class called serializer. It's a bit confusing serialization normalization. I'm not going to go into the details of that. Uh, but it just says, hey, I got some data in with, I got some data, figure it out. So how does that work? There is a uh, class that's a, a, ser uh, it's a symphony class, so uh, I'm not going to show the details of that, but the idea is that it just gets a list of all these normalizers. So it's, it's just a long list of an instance of every class, and every class has a normalized method that can do what we just showed, but it also has a support normalization method. And it does what you expect it to do. You give it an object and then it returns true or false based on whether this class can actually normalize that or not. Uh, so the entity normalizer says, okay, I can only normalize things that are actually entities. So you see here, it uses a, a, a property to save that, but uh, if you go to the base, then you see there's a support normalization method, which just checks, is the object an instance of the supported class or object, and then it, uh, then it returns true or false based on that. Relatively simple. So that's how, how Drupal generates this. Then what you already saw is that this is actually relatively complicated data. So a node ID, we know that, there, that every node has a node ID and that there is only one. But based on this structure, you cannot deduce that. There's the, the, the Drupal knows that, but in reality, uh, if you take a look at this data and you handle it in the front end, you still have to say, okay, I want the node object and I want the, the, the node ID field and I want the first element and I want the value of that. But we know that that's the only data that's there. And Drupal knows that as well, but it's just not encoding that here. Uh, so parsing and using this data structure is actually relatively complicated and also error prone because we, we take a look at this JSON structure and we think, oh, okay, a node always has a node ID. And then if you take a, think a little further, then you realize that the node doesn't always have a node ID because a node could also be not saved. And then it doesn't have a node ID. So the node ID is actually not a required property on a node object. You can, so if you just use this manually, you can make a lot of un based assumptions about this data. That was this data structure. So we have the serialization module and the normalized class and the go type type down. Because I already said we are creating that front end using type script and React and the React part is out of picture for today. Uh, so what is type script exactly? Type script is basically just JavaScript. If you don't enable the strict checking of TypeScript, then normal JavaScript is also valid TypeScript. But it allows static type annotations. I'll show you in a minute what it means, but, it actually, uh, but, but the idea is that for every variable that is passed around, it's not just a variable, but every variable has a type. There's in the compiler, it knows how oh, this variable should always be a number, or it should always be a string, or it can be a string or a number, but if you then assign something that's not a string or a number, then it will fail. That's the idea. And it compiles the plain JavaScript, so there's a compiler that checks if you didn't, make any, didn't do anything stupid with the types, and strips all the types away, so the end result is just normal JavaScript. And 
doing so prevents a lot of bugs because there's a lot of code that looks like from a JavaScript but generates errors because you pass around objects that functions don't expect. I'll show you a bit on how TypeScript works. So the idea is basically what I already said, there's, it's just JavaScript. So we can just say let A is a number uh, and this is okay. So this is just, this is just JavaScript and TypeScript understands it. If I then hover over it, then TypeScript already deduced that A is a number because I, I assigned a number to it. And if I then later say A is blah, then it says, yeah, but you're now assigning something that's a string to something that I just deduced that it is a number. That's not gonna work. So basically TypeScript said, okay, this is how it is. So now I'm writing out the, the specific type, but I could also tell uh, TypeScript to say, okay, it's a number or a string. And now it accepts this. So you can, every variable has types and TypeScript checks all of them. So uh, let's, let's have another example. You can have function. Let's call this function B and this function accepts a number and it also returns a number and what it basically does, it just increases the number. It's a very, very simple function. So it's, it, it, it gets a number, adds one to it and returns that. Very simple. And I added the type annotation. So TypeScript now knows that this function always should receive a number and always returns a number. Now, if I try to call B so I say, let C is B with a number, then TypeScript says, okay, this is perfectly fine. No problems here. But if I say, let D is B blah, then it says, but wait, you're putting in a string into something that is actually expecting a number. So TypeScript knows that this is not, not valid and it will not compile, which prevents a lot of bugs because in this simple case, this won't happen, of course. You know this is fun, uh, you wouldn't even write this thing in a function. But if you get more complicated functions with more complicated objects, then a lot of mistakes can happen with this, with types of objects being passed around that you don't expect. Especially if you get to more complicated objects, like for example, uh, well, let's, uh, let's write someone, so we have a person, uh, and the name of this person is, uh, let's call him Dries. This is how you write it, right? Does anyone know how old Dries is? I think 35 or something like that. I didn't prepare that. Uh, so now TypeScript knows that, a, that, that, that the person is an object, which has a name, that's a string, and it has an H, which is a number. Uh, but if I change something here and I say age is um, uh, not that old, then TypeScript says now age is a string. So the types can really easily change if TypeScript has to infer the types itself. But we can define those types. So we can say there is such a thing as a person which has a name which is a string and it has an age which is a number. And then we can say, okay, this person that we're creating here, I'm telling you that this should be of the type person. And then TypeScript complains here because it says this age that you're assigning here is not a number, so it should be a number. I don't know if you certified, but I'm going to insert it anyway. Um, so that's, that, that's how TypeScript can handle things. And TypeScript is also kind of intelligent in helping you write code because now, uh, I can say console.log, or I can even do this. So, uh, no. So if I call this, what's it doing? I call my, what's happening? My x function, right. So my x function says, I, uh, sorry, not my x, my b function, expects a number. Currently it complains because it didn't put anything in. But if I do person, then, person dot. Now it knows that person is of the type person, so it knows that it should have an age and a name, uh, and it tells you what the types of those properties are, 
and it can also combine this. So if I say person.age, then it accepts this. But if I say person.name, then it knows that it is a string and uh, it's not going, going to flow, right? So TypeScript helps with preventing a lot of yeah, relatively stupid but easy to make bugs in your code, which uh, helps in making sure that you spend your time debugging on just by, uh, the interesting parts, like logic things that, that, that you have, that can have a discussion about with your client, uh, which is a lot more interesting than the application breaks. Uh, so that's the, the basic idea of TypeScript. Now, if we want to use TypeScript with the Drupal API, then the real sensible way of handling that would be that we describe in a TypeScript type how a node in Drupal looks. Right? So, so we can use it in a sensible way. So we can have a function that we can write down this function expects a node and then does something useful with that node. But now we have no way of describing what a node is. So if we are going to do that, uh, then I'm going to switch to a different tool. Uh, here we go. So if we go to our demo theme. Uh, da, da, da. So we want to describe what a node actually is. So a node, we know that a node has a property called a node ID, which is a node ID item, and then a list of that. Um, we, then we need, also need to describe what a node ID item actually is, which is an object that has a value, which is a number. Uh, but then there is also, for example, the, uh, the title. So there is a title, which is a title item, or actually a string item, so it would be So, uh, export, there we go. And then we need to describe what a string item is. So we have a string item is uh, a value, which is a string. And you can see that if you have, only for the base properties of nodes, this can already get pretty big. But if you then have nodes which have multiple fields that are in any way a little bit interesting, then this can get really, really big. And even further, if you, for example, have a field which represents paragraphs, and you also want the type for your paragraphs, and every paragraph has different types with also different fields, this can, can get big very, very quickly if you want any sensible types. Uh, and we actually do need them because uh, here I have an example function which fetches data from Drupal, which just, it just calls a JSON API, and it says, okay, what I return is a node. And then in our demo, now we can say, okay, A is a node, Drupal knows, uh, TypeScript knows that, so A is a node, so we can say A dot title. Uh, it's not, uh, not really working now, of course. PHP Storm isn't really great with, uh, uh, with TypeScript sometimes. So I'll just switch to uh, code for that. Uh, this is the joys of live demos. Uh, let me see. Uh, so here we go. Does this work? Hopefully it does. Um, so here we have the demo, and what's this? Yeah, it says A is a result for a node, so uh, it's a bit, bit more complicated, so A doesn't necessarily have a node, so, I, so uh, let, let's, let's keep it this way now. Uh, so now we can compile this JavaScript, so let's do that. Um, I prepared this talk for the Drupal Tech Talk, so the directory is still called Drupal Tech Talk. Um, let me see. Uh, yeah. Yes. So now it compiles the JavaScript. And if we wait for that, 
Uh, let's add the watch here because we're too late to wait for this. So now it will just say here is the node object that we got. Um, now, now it's a TypeScript, but to do anything useful with it, we will need, uh, we, we get an A here, and the A is either a string, uh, I'm getting a bit confused here, uh, let's see, so if A is uh, error, then we just console log, and otherwise we do console log A dot, and now we now TypeScript knows that A is not an error, so there nothing went wrong with the retrieving of the node from Drupal. Now A is a node, and A therefore has a title, and the title has properties, and every property has a value. But generating the, the, the creating all that code that describes how Drupal outputs its data can become really, really a lot of data. Um, therefore, we like to generate that because we don't like to write a lot of re repetitive code. So, uh, where's my PHP storm gone? Oh, here it is, of course. Yeah. So, for PHP. Yeah, good. So, we created a small module to demo this. Now let's see, where did it go? Modules. I called this module TypeScript. Uh, mm. It's just a simple module, no dependencies, nothing, uh, nothing special. This is just a demo module. So uh, what we did is we, gen we actually gen created the same structure as we did with generating entities. Because Drupal has not only an entity class, it also has an entity type class. And that entity type class describes how a certain entity type works. So if we have a class like a normalizer, but then a little bit different, which we can give an entity type and then gives us a type definition of that entity, that would be really useful because Drupal actually knows how a node object is constructed. And for field items, there's also a field definition plus. And for every data, there's also different classes that describe that. So we can use this same structure as we use here to generate TypeScript code. And I'm going to show you how that works a bit. So, uh, Here's a service file which currently defines only one generator, which is we call it the any generator. Any is TypeScript's type for everything can happen. You usually shouldn't use that, but it's a good fallback for things you don't know what it is. So you write so we start with anything that we don't recognize and we try to generate types for it, then it generates any. So that type that generator looks a bit like this. This, uh, where is it? Here's the any generator, and the any generator has a function called supports generation, which always returns true because the, uh, because we can always generate any for something. Can can be not very useful, but it is valid. Uh, and it has a generate type function, which just returns any. Then, if we use this. Uh, is this the correct one? Yeah, here it is. So, uh, TS generate. So now, uh, this is a bit much. Um, I think I still have the old search file uh, cached. Yeah, that's better. So now, if I say here in the drush command, I say get the definition of a node and generate something useful for that. That's basically what this code says. If I do that, then now the only thing it can generate is 
any, because it doesn't know what a node looks like. But I made an example generator for an entity. So here we have a relatively naive but functioning uh, generator for an entity. So what it does, it says, okay, I want to generate the type of this entity, and how do I do that? I get all the base field definitions of the entity type, so and, uh, for a node that would be the node, the node ID and the title and the status and the revision ID and stuff like that. And then it loops over each of them, checks if they're not internal, and if they're not internal, then it says to the generator, please generate something useful for this object that I get to you. Currently, the generator, of course, doesn't know what to do with that, but we'll get to that in a minute. So if we enable this, then, uh, and we get a cache again, cache clearing always takes time, don't know why, but it does. So now it says that a node, uh, can we make this a little bigger? Yeah. So it says, okay, there is such a thing as a node, and a node has all kinds of properties. It currently doesn't know what those properties are, but it's, um, it's a star. So there is a node ID, there is a UU ID, and all kinds of things that's coming out of Drupal. Then we have a basic generator for fields. Uh, and a field generator basically works a bit like an entity generator. It loops over all the, it gets a field definition interface and uh, it loops over all the properties of that field. And if it's not internal, then it tries to generate something useful for that property and uh, creates an object to represent that. So if we uh, clear the cache again, because I change the services file, that's the bad news about this demo, that I constantly am changing the services file, um, and we regenerate. Now it already generates a lot more types. So now for every type of fields that it encounters, it creates a definition of what an item looks like, well currently it's just any, but you can imagine that you can have more classes that understand what a number or, or an integer object look like, uh, and that it should be a list, and eventually it says here, a node has a node ID which is an integer, integer is defined to be a list of integer items, and every integer item has a value, currently it's any, so you get the idea. You can see that this code is, is growing very fast and that it's a good idea to, to generate this instead of writing this all yourself. Because it's also changing very easily because now we're just taking a look at the base fields of a node. It's not like Drupal will overnight add an extra property to every node. But what does happen is that we, when we develop our websites, just add extra properties to nodes. So uh, that's why we also have to account for the different bundles of nodes that we have. I'm not going to show all the code, but I am going to enable the services that we that I made up for that. Uh, and if I then generate the code, then it becomes even more complicated. Now it says a node is either a node article or a node page, and a node page has a lot of properties. Uh, and a body, and a node article also has the same list of properties, but then a body and a comma and comments and an image and tags. So there's a lot more data there. And so, so Drupal is, is capable of handling, uh, of, of having a lot of fields, and this can, can grow very, very big. Uh, this is a bit of a naive implementation. Uh, it's just a, a toy now. Uh, but we also created something a little less naive. Um, to show you how it works, I'm first going to show you another Drupal installation. Um, this is a, uh, a copy of the Drupal installation that we use for a lot of our projects. And uh, what it does, it, 
it has the, uh, it has different content types, and for every content type, it also defines a body field or page content field, we call it, and it, that contains paragraphs. I think most of you know the paragraph module. If you don't, please check it out. It is a really good module. We didn't write it; it was written by another uh, Rotterdam company called PDMI. There, it, it's amazing. What it does is allows you to break up the content of your website into little blocks on a page. Like most pages are basically long list of elements placed under each other, and uh, the paragraph mod module allows you to module to model that in your data structure in Drupal. So I created a test page there in this installation, uh, and it has a, a, a title and an introduction and links and an image. And it has this content field with a lot of different, we call them building blocks for our clients and just paragraph entities uh, with all kinds of properties. And uh, to make our lives a little easier to work with this, we generate, we uh, created a bit of custom normalizers for field items for the type entity references. To, so it, in the case of paragraphs, it actually embeds those paragraphs in the result that Drupal gives. So that result can get really, really big. And we created a module which is capable of handling that logic. Uh, so I'm going to show that uh, GS generator generate. No, that is not it. That is for a different project. Uh, TS generator settings. So, this code inspects the whole Drupal installation and generates a lot of types for it. So, uh, I'm going to show it to you what it generated. Uh, there we go. Uh, where did it generate it then, of course, somewhere, okay. So we have a, so it generated, it generated two files, a partial.ts and a types.ts. Uh, and the types.ts create, uh, consists of two different types. Uh, what we, what we found is that the, the data structure that Drupal has, where we have a node which has a node ID which is a list with an object, is not really nice to work with when you're working with that object in JavaScript. So we created two representations of that node. One is the representation of what comes out of Drupal, and the other is, a, is what would we like to work with in our front end. And, uh, to make those work together, we also automatically generate functions to convert from one to the other. So, in the case of nodes, uh, let me see, uh, where is nodes? Of course, I can't find it. Uh, here is a node. So, a node is either a, a node of the type homepage or a node of the type page. So, let's look at the look at page. A node page is a node base plus some extra uh, properties. It has an introduction, which is a list of strings. It has an introduction image, which is a list of media references. And it has links, which is a list of link items, and so on. So for every node type, it automatically generates this. And it also converts it to something more useful to work with. So we have a parsed node page which says the introduction is either a string or null, because it, ha it is not required. Uh, the introduction image is either a parsed media image or undefined or null. The null checking is not really great still, but we're working on that. Uh, and links items is a list, because it can be two links, so it's a list. So this code knows the whole structure of how that data looks like, and it also knows that the content is a list of paragraphs, and it knows which paragraphs are available for that node type. So there's a lot of intelligence in in your code, in this generated code now, that really helps a lot with uh, using it. And I'm 
I'm going to show a bit how that works. So now here I have that same situation as we had with uh, in in the previous demo. So I have a a entity object which can either be an error or something useful. And that entity object. Now I check if it's an error, then I'm not interested. And then I can say, okay, if the entity has a entity type which is node, for example, it knows that node is a valid value for entity type, then uh, it also knows that a node has a bundle. So I can say if entity dot bundle is now, and then it suggests which are the available bundles that even exist. And I say, okay, if it's a page, then I can do console.log uh, entity dot, uh, well, field page content is a really bad example. So I can say, for example, entity dot label. So it knows that the title is the label of the node, so it calls it entity dot label. Uh, but I can also get the node ID, uh, does that work? Uh, oh, I called it ID here. Yeah. So it, it knows that a, a node has an ID and it has, and that is of the type number. And it knows all the fields that are there. So for example, the, the home page doesn't have a field introduction, but the page does and it knows that it has, uh, that, that we're talking about pages here. So it knows that there is an introduction field. This code is automatically generated, and it's a lot of code. Uh, it's like a thousand lines of, of TypeScript type definition, and the parsers are even longer, I think. No, it's not longer. Sorry. Uh, this helps us a lot with creating applications which are uh, really reliable, uh, because the TypeScript allows us to be more... Uh, more precise to, be, to make sure, to prevent a lot of categories of bugs, uh, but we don't have to write it all ourselves. So I showed you the module. Uh, I think I'm going to need to wrap up. Uh, so uh, what we, this module is a, is a published module. We put it on GitHub, um, and uh, we we are still actively developing on it. We're also slowly thinking about the second version of this module because currently it does only TypeScript. Uh, we would like it to support more languages than just TypeScript because uh, TypeScript is one of the places where we parse our notes, but we also do that, for example, in C-sharp. Uh, and uh, we would like to have multiple languages to be able to understand this because the more the, uh, the TypeScript is not the only type-safe language where this, that would benefit from this. Uh, there's also uh, the idea to generate a little bit more uh, components. So uh, may, uh, we're thinking about uh, maybe we can expand this module to not only generate types, but actually generate uh, React components or view components or whatever framework components that display the notes already. So you can, because a lot of how, a con how some, some data should be displayed can already be deduced from the types. Uh, and currently it doesn't support themes, uh, which is very useful if it is, uh, but it doesn't yet. Uh, and th that's also something that we're working on. Uh, that was the, 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 the talk. I work at Hoffinger, uh, as probably about every company here. We are also looking for engineers if you like to push the boundaries of technology in ways like this, then, that, uh, then we're looking for you. Uh, questions?